from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Thanks a lot for the excellent presentation and uh, discussions. My question is that uh, uh, if uh, the good law cannot be implemented, sometimes it's because of a social structure or political system existing there. Sometimes it's because of uh, social norms. Could Mr. Basu uh, make a further ex uh, clar clarification that we'll see what is the function of a focal point if the law would change social norms? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for a, an excellent presentation. Uh, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first one has to do with the fact that you said uh, picking uh, somebody's wallet may not necessarily uh, be due to doing some cost-benefit analysis, but social norms may have a very important role to play. I will beg to differ on that because the whole idea here is that people may be doing cost-benefit analysis, but they will be factoring in the social norm. If we, can impose, if we can calculate the psychic cost of guilt, shame, and then add that to the monetary uh, cost of benefit, of engaging in crime, we will be able to have a better, num uh, uh, sorry, better figures for our cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the second point is I would like to know your view on discretionary punishment, where judges are given big windows where they can make decisions as to whether to send someone to jail for uh, one day or 25 years. I say this because in Ghana, uh, people believe that judges are legally corrupt. Uh, they tend to jail people who are uh, less privileged in society uh, more severely than those people who are at the upper end of the social ladder. And I took some data and did some analysis and then found out that if you look at the punishment people receive uh, when, when they steal, as supposing that they are prosecuted, uh, and then you try to look at that relationship with the, the total amount of money that is stolen, you realize that uh, if you steal uh, let's say 1% more, less 1% uh, uh, more, the punishment you receive uh, reduces by 0 0.8. So the incentive is there for you to steal more than to steal less. So what is your view on discretionary punishment for our this is concerned? Thank you. Can you introduce yourself when you ask, before asking a question, please? Sure, I'm Douglas Arendt from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I would love to hear some comments on, the, on, the, on your perspective on sustainability and sustainable development relative to both what I would call uh, local public goods but also uh, the global commons and goods and what the interface is between law, social norms and sustainability. Samuel Wangwe from Tanzania. Thank you very much for the very excellent uh, uh, expose on these issues. I wanted to raise just two points. One is uh, uh, have we seen the role of uh, uh, information and communication technologies in reducing the contact between the briber and the bribee to see if uh, that has played a role in uh, some countries? Uh, second, uh, any comments on political corruption? Political corruption comes to a situation where there is really high level of pretense. People say we don't want corruption, this is really bad. And this, uh, there are laws to, to actually curb corruption. But the same people who pass the law engage in very high level of corruption, politically. Now the same people who say this is really bad are the same ones who do it. But if one of them falls out of favor, then they say, ah, corruption. We said corruption is bad. Political corruption, to me, it seems uh, brings a new dimension in the whole discussion of corruption, because it's those guys who are themselves passing laws, supervising, are the ones in the forefront. And in Africa in particular, <coughs> uh, maybe in other developing countries, this seems to be a complicated dimension to deal with, especially when it comes to administering development. I'll ask you to sure. answer this first wave of questions, and then sure. we'll take more questions afterwards. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, I'm let sorry. me uh, go in order. Um, the, sorry, yeah. Um, 
Yes, I will also. Actually, uh, I've got, as I speak about this, I will I'm going to build in a little bit uh, onto this. Um, I, I'll just take a chord of what you're asking. Um, can laws uh, be used to change norms? And in fact, that question relates to both what, uh, a little bit of what Ernest said and what uh, Harun said is, um, you know, um, before you first of all use uh, laws to change norms, you have to be once a bit careful that norms have very often come into existence for some reason. And there's actually some analysis which is an evolutionary analysis of norms done by economists, which sort of uh, um, endorses what Ernest was saying about the case of no fishing on Tuesdays. Some of, this, some of these norms could have socially desirable effects. So the norms have come into existence because societies that had these norms have replicated and done better. So before, uh, I'm sort of asking, uh, answering a pre-question to your question, that before you think in terms of uh, changing a norm, you have to think a little bit about the norm's original role. Having said that, I also believe that there are many norms which came into reason, yes, for these functional, historical, evolutionary reasons, but societies change, but the norm stays on, and they become dysfunctional norms in society doing a lot of uh, damage to society, but they are still there. There you do want to bring in the law to change. Two ways of doing that. One is to directly use the law to just outlaw that kind of norms-based behavior. But the other one actually now relates to what Harun was uh, saying, is that certain laws uh, can begin to change your mindset. The minimum wage law is an example. Even if it's not being Im implemented, it begins to change the way you think. And there is a very important contribution. This is from a lawyer, Cass Sunstein. He talks about the expressionist function of law. That law often takes the form of not actually it's the hard law, what it says you'll do, and the police coming and catching you if you don't, but it changes your mindset and the way you think about a question, and that gets uh, um, followed through that. So that's the way to approach social norms through law. The second question over there, the cost benefit, I think we are completely on the same page, just that we are using the language a bit differently. So when I said that it's not narrow cost-benefit analysis, but social norms matter, what you're saying is that it is cost-benefit analysis taking into account the fact that some of the costs are normative costs. I don't want to behave in a certain way which will inflict stigma on me. I, and I completely agree with you. On the language, I can fuss a little bit about whether we should always use the language of cost-benefit analysis. I do have some hesitation on that. But when I would do an exercise like this formally, I would, I think, do it exactly the way you're uh, suggesting should be done, that keep it as cost-benefit analysis, but enrich the notion of what constitutes cost and what constitutes benefits. And there, the norms and the social stigma could come in. Agreed. On um, discretionary punish punishment and uh, judges, you know, this is a huge problem. Uh, that um, uh, in the end, um, even if you don't have discretionary punishment, which side has won, that verdict the judge has to give. And there's a lot of scope for a judge to be corrupt and uh, do something in favor of the richer client rather than the poorer client. This evidence that you said, I've never seen it, but it's fascinating that if you're stealing, steal a lot, your punishment will go down. It sort of fits in with some priors that that's possible. You become a bigger player and the punishment goes down. What do you do about that? I wish I had an answer. But all I will tell you is that this simply emphasizes once again that these kinds of problems of corruption, once you bring in the police, the judge and everyone, very often it's impossible to close it through pure cost-benefit rational argument. The social norms are also very, very important. People having different norms in their head. And that I'm going to relate, I'll come back to this just now in a moment and uh, take the sustainability question I'll, and I'll return to this. Again, sustainability is such a, a big topic that for me to jump and immediately be able to relate to what I'm talking about with that I can't do, it will take me time. But I want to stress the last part of my talk, which I did not manage to go into, that for a lot of sustainability matters, again, the human social norms are important. And that brings me back to the previous question. To try to cure these problems entirely through taxation and benefits, you typically won't succeed. You can succeed with individuals, but the judge could be corrupt. So 
you, the norms are very important. All I can tell you how you change norms, I don't know. So I won't even pretend to say I, I know. But I do know that norms change. And that gives me hope that human norms are malleable. Example, when in the West uh, the norm started that you don't smoke in a public place, initially you may have actually laws that if you smoke in a public place that you get punished by that. This was soon, there was talk that India would start that uh, law that you don't smoke in a public place. And my initial thought was that it's impossible to correct this. I mean, it's too anarchic a society, too free-floating a society, making this a law. After all, you can't have a police standing in each room and that police can get bribed, you'll never get it. The smoking norm in India changed over a 10-year period. No one lights up in a crowded room. And you don't even need the law anymore. I feel a lot of our environmental behavior has to rely on human thinking changing. Trouble is, we have very little understanding of what leads human thought to change. One of the reasons why we chose this year's World Development Report uh, on this topic is precisely because of my own belief that the way we think, the mental models we carry in our heads are extremely important, and you cannot solve this entire problem from, from the petty criminal to the judge. You can't solve it all just by changing the punishments and jail terms, you won't do it. In the end, you do need to work on human norms, and the first step in that is understanding, and that's what we are trying to do. And finally, um, uh, the yeah, technology to reduce contact between briber and bribee, certainly, it's extremely important. And these very, very simple things have already began to change the landscape of a lot of corruption. Uh, one of the things that is being used in India in a quite a sophisticated way is a biomarker system for identifying individuals. It's called the Aadhaar program. And this is being developed by some of the best software minds. Once this comes into place, again, the expectation is that for a lot of basic benefits, the human contact will be minimal. You will be recognized by your um, uh, retina and your fingerprints, and certain transactions will take place. Money will move into a bank, your bank account by the recognition when you go and identify yourself. So that's very important. On political uh, uh, corruption, I have one word, uh, uh, one little thing I have to point out. Lot of political corruption, we have to simply understand, takes the form of barter. I do you a favor and you do me a favor. A lot of it actually money does not even change hand. It's just you're performing barter at the top of the country. And the popular belief that barter takes place amongst the poorest people, I'll give you one fish, you give me um, a little bit of rice. Yes, that does take place, but barter is much more prevalent at the top at the political level, and that's another game because it is very often money is not changing hand, so you can't catch it through conventional means. So once again, this brings me back to the first point that I was making, that a lot of this has to depend ultimately on human social norms, no guarantee. I'm not a foolish optimist to think that someday all this will get cured, maybe it won't, but at least we begin to get some handles on how we do better and move inch towards that. Thank you. Uh, let's take another round of questions. Can you introduce yourself? And then Thank you, ma'am. My name is Olawale Nkola from Nigeria. I think it's important to also look at the origin of law. Law in itself is not devoid of corruption. We lawmaker the multi-objectives. And we've seen situations where some laws are not comfortable to lawmakers, and they make the law weaker, just to buttress the political kind of uh, problem that we have. Where you've seen a government that is not sharing money being voted out of power. In other words, <coughs> there is no way we can move on without this consultation, without excessive carrying stakeholders along. Again, we are back to the issue of a norm and social order. Because when you have predominant people not actually want to abide by a rule or order, where do we go from there? Because it's important you can combine democracy in some cases. But of course, you need democracy to be able to move forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'm Peter Kwarte from University of Ghana. Um, laws do not support development, and I think I tend to side with what Professor Ite said. But then I want us to, I want your view on, on this point, that um, the lawmakers themselves leave a lot of room for interpretation, um, again, for their selfish interest, and that does not uh, promote development. I, I want your views on this, this point. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Fundi Chazibana from the National Treasury in South Africa. I mean, the one interesting thing to me is why do lawmakers often write laws that they can't implement, which brings us into the area of credibility, because that does undermine whether a law can be effective or not. If members of the public know that there's not enough resources to implement, we find this in South Africa with regards to municipal bylaws. You have these bylaws, but because things you're contravening the law in your own house, in your own car, the cops can't find you, and therefore um, you can go about um, sort of your 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 usual day to day. Um, the second question I've got is around an acceptable period to amend the law. Um, so Sorry. acceptable periods to amend laws to take into account the development needs when you've got this uh, interest. Because every time you make an amendment, it depends on who the strongest interest group is at the time. <coughs> so you always have these moving targets all the time, so you're thinking, I'm achieving the greater good, but it's always the greater good of an interest of whoever the strongest interest is at a particular period. I'd like reflections, thanks. Tony? Um, Tony Addison from uh, UNU Wider in Helsinki. Um, Koshik, we, we have a lot of young researchers here at the conference, and they're all thirsting to write uh, great papers. So my question to you is, what topics should they be working on that are going to produce those great papers? Thank you. Thank you very much. I am Patricia Adamu from Nigeria. Uh, from um, the discussion of uh, Professor Basu, uh, it's get towards the, the masses, the individuals, you know, the citizens, trying to change uh, the social norm. What about the lawmakers themselves, the government? You see, there has been cases, for instance, in my country, where uh, somebody will steal a mobile phone, for instance, worth $50, and uh, another person will steal from the government uh, public fund worth billions of uh, dollars, and uh, nothing is done to that. The one that steals uh, $50 worth of mobile phone is jailed for seven years, and the man who takes, steals billions of uh, dollars is asked to refund maybe uh, 25, I mean, five, I mean, three million uh, uh, dollars, and he goes cost free. So, what do we do? How do we, you know, change the norm of the public, I mean, government, so that everything will work together well, and then, you know, the, we can now develop, I mean, the, there will be development, economic development in our country. Thank you. Koshik, you want to answer? This yeah. Let me actually do the following. I'll take the um, question, uh, excepting Tony, all the others let me pull in because actually you're asking very similar question. I understand uh, where we are coming from. This is indeed very troubling. And you see this, um, the most blatant cases, very often it is true. There's no getting away from the, that fact that you see these in poorer countries and emerging economies, the most blatant cases. But this happens. Corruption at the top in subtle forms, very often not changing money. Subtle forms happen even in rich countries. The lawmaker could have certain kinds of vested interest. Uh, since there were two questions from Nigeria, I suddenly remembered years ago, I had read this very beautiful uh, piece by a writer, 
I may be getting the name wrong, Adewal Maja Pierce uh, in London a Review of Books, uh, saying how in one case uh, he got into uh, a, a trouble with someone on some uh, matter with a local citizen and called the police. And the police made them bid for the higher bribe that between the two of them that they would pay to the police. And uh, the higher bribe person, the other person got a punch or two from the policeman and the policeman took away the bribe and went away. This is actually the same question. In this case, it's the bribe, uh, the uh, police who's the enforcer, but you're taking the question one level higher up from your question on democracy to lawmakers to um, uh, why do people uh, make laws which are not good for society. It is all about the lawmakers. The trouble is, I wish I had an easy answer. I don't. I mean, this is very painful. I've seen this happen all the time. And as I'm sort of warning you, it happens in a very blatant fashion in poorer countries, emerging economies. It happens in subtle ways even in rich countries. There is a bit of a collusion at the top which plagues the world. But in the end, I'm giving you, I know it's a very lame thought that I'm bringing to the table simply because I don't have an easy thought, is we have to make these things clear. Write about these, that these things are happening. Ordinary people's realization that something is wrong and should not be the case leads to changed behavior. All I know about human social norms is realizing something is bad by ordinary people helps. And some of the worst injustices in life, uh, and you can take it across uh, countries, uh, uh, discrimination, racial discrimination in the United States, apartheid in South Africa, caste practices in India, you'll get examples galore. The way these things persist over time is you lull people into believing that what's happening is normal and correct. It's when that thought breaks down, you realize that this is not normal. I've been lulled into believing that this is normal, that change comes. And I'm taking all the sort of questions that you're bringing on the lawmakers, is making people aware that, look, don't get lulled that the lawmakers are the ultimate authority thinking of the social good. They are very often not doing that. And that kind of social activism to me is very, very important. You have to change, stop people from getting lulled into believing things are right. I can give you examples galore of how most of the biggest injustices in life continue simply because the person who suffers does not realize that it's an unjust suffering. You take it to be uh, dished out from heaven or whatever and that's why you're there. So just the awareness is welcome. And now finally, to Tony's question. Topics that students should work on. Uh, there's always a bit of a tendency to think of topics which are of interest to you, uh, meaning to me. I didn't mean Tony, interest uh, to me, and suggest those topics. But I can tell you, uh, currently, the sorts of things which are of uh, great interest to me, a couple of things I can tell you. And I'm going a bit beyond th this lecture. Uh, and this is of interest, I hopefully, to wider to the World Bank and all. One mistake, I feel, the microeconomics, macroeconomics divide has done in the policy making field where we do need a lot of fresh thinking. Very often when you have a program which is a micro intervention to help people. So some nutrition program running in a thousand villages in South Africa or Tanzania or somewhere. Or an employment guarantee program running in 5000 villages in India. Where we usually, the way we usually uh, analyze these is you send researchers if they are sophisticated, they'll do randomization, take some places where you have this intervention, other places where you don't, you see the effect of this. If you can't randomize, you just collect data in that village and see what has happened in that village. One huge mistake happens through this and where we need a bit of innovative research. Suppose you're running a program, I don't know, some uh, um, intervention in a thousand or 5,000 or 10,000 villages, employment uh, intervention or something else. Let us suppose you find that it's successful in these entire 5,000 villages. People's nutrition level has improved, poverty is less. Usually we end by saying that the program has succeeded. What is forgotten is to run a program like this in an economy has macroeconomic implications. You are, the fiscal deficit could be going up. You could be generating monetary expansion while you do this. And if you keep that in mind, it's entirely possible that in these 10,000 villages, the program succeeded. People have risen out of the poverty line. But in another 50,000 villages, which had nothing to do with this program, where the side effect of this, which is in terms of prices rising, that reached and nothing else reached, where more people have gone into poverty. 
One reason why poverty eradication is so hard, we have so many programs running, I believe, is because we have this cleavage between the micro and the macro analysis means we very often forget about the side effect, which takes place 2,000 miles away in another village, where these people are not there. But through the macroeconomic channels, an effect has gone over there. I've now come away from both my India experience and now that I work in the World Bank and see a lot of these programs. We have to begin to marry better the micro-macro bridge. And that is what, after all, a profession is. Just going to the village and seeing people are better off, anyone can do. You don't need a hard profession for that. But the strange channels through which this can transmit and go elsewhere, the profession has given us certain tools of analysis. These tools are not easy. These macroeconomic analysis across sectors is difficult. But this is a very important topic in an area where you can get a lot of impact coming out of that. Then, so this is one broad area, the micro-macro divide, and I've been trying to push the World Bank to do a little bit more of that. Another area, and this is, of course comes a bit from my orientation, uh, you know, historically, um, economics was, uh, two, three minutes more, I can take over this. Historically, I do believe that economics had erred on the side of excessive theory. You just did theory, very little sense of the way the world is panning out. It's very welcome that this has changed. The amount of data we are now generating around the world is huge. A lot of understanding coming out of this. But at times I'm worrying that we should not make the mistake of pushing to the other extreme and doing a data, not data-based analysis, but a data-waved analysis. You collect data, wave the data, and then you go and implement some policy. Data-based analysis means when from the data you're going to a policy, you actually have to think a lot of what the data says. And that's where you do need some analytical thinking. And so I'm giving, I'm not giving you specific topics that I can give you over coffee after the break. But again, bringing some an analytical thought into data-based analysis is extremely important. And I see all the time people will tell you that, look, last 20 years, this is what happened. You went in for this intervention, this is what happened. Therefore, and very quick jump to tomorrow we should do this. To me, that therefore very often is a non sequitur. It has no meaning. You've waved some data in front of my face, and you've gone back to your prejudices. That therefore, that basing of the data needs much better analysis. And if the younger people there, well, even the older people should try, but all of us get usually set in our ways. It's very difficult to change our ways. The younger people could try to marry this as well, the data work and analytics before you jump to conclusions about what the data says in terms of policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kushi. Thank you for the very challenging thoughts in your presentation, and we look forward to the new WDR, certainly. And many thanks for your last thought about uh, the new, um, new di direction for research. Thank you also to Ernest and to Arun for their comments. And now let me uh, conclude this uh, session and call upon Finn, who has a couple of things to tell us. Thank you very much. Thank you.